So mental health statistics show that one out of four people suffers from a mental illness. So I'd like each and every one of you to think about your three closest friends. And if they all seem normal, then it's you. <laughs> I'd like to give a little bit of background. We recently had this horrible massacre, 17 people killed by Nicholas Cruz down in Florida. And it's important to understand what type of laws we currently have and how we could have prevented or foreseen or not been able to prevent what was happening on the basis of some of our current laws. I started looking into some of these some of these laws that have been decided in regards to mental illness and what they would allow people to do. And interestingly enough, there is a case called O'Connor v. Donaldson in 1975. And this was a Supreme Court decision. And what the decision decided is that you cannot confine a non-dangerous individual. And second, you, that that individual can refuse treatment. Now in Alabama, they used to sterilize the people who were considered to be mentally retarded. There was a court case and it came down that you can no longer involuntarily sterilize these mentally retarded people. No matter that you didn't want them to have children and have a second or third generation of people who couldn't take care of themselves. So when this was decided, it seemed like a good decision. Well, we don't want to involuntarily do this. But what it meant is that you can now put a mentally ill person into a hospital and they could say, I don't want any treatment. I think I'm fine. Now, we've seen, interestingly enough, in like Beauty and the Beast. I don't know if, has everyone seen Beauty and the Beast? Did you remember Maurice, the crazy dad who, came, who was an inventor, but nobody else understood him, so they all thought he was crazy? And somebody came along who was bribed in order to commit him to an asylum. And at the last second, he shows that he wasn't rambling or hallucinating because he shows the beast that he had saw, and so he doesn't have to go to the asylum. Well, that is a case that illustrates a, a, what was known as parens patriae. So you could commit somebody because you were doing them a favor. If they were nuts, they didn't even have to be dangerous. If they were nuts, if they were danger to themselves, if they couldn't take care of themselves, then you could commit them to a hospital. But as they showed in that Beauty and the Beast, it could be abused. You could, and in the case of the Beauty and the Beast, uh, the guy who was in charge of the asylum was paid off. He was paid money by the bad guy in the whole movie in order to try and put the father into the asylum in order to blackmail him into letting his daughter marry uh, the bad guy. So there's been specific cases, I mean that's a case of fiction, but there's actual real life examples where stuff like this happens. And the problem with the law is the law comes in and sees something that it doesn't like and then passes a whole new law and the unintended consequences are that you're then stuck not being able to commit somebody who should be committed. The ACLU actually sued to prevent the commitment of a mentally ill homeless person who was eating their own feces because that violated their freedom. And the ACLU is all about freedom. All they care about in that particular case was freedom. They wanted the homeless person to be able to continue to be homeless and eat their own feces rather than have them committed to a hospital. And so they sued, and that was a case called Lesser v. Schmidt in 1974. So they abandoned the idea that you can now commit people to a hospital for their own good. And also in that case, it was no longer a doctor. If you remember in the Beauty and the Beast, it was a pseudo-doctor who was coming in to say, we're going to commit Maurice. Well, now it's lawyers who decide that. You actually, if you're going to be committed for a mental health reason where you're a danger to yourself, they have taken away the right for a doctor to come in and make the decision. They now have to have rules of evidence. You can, you have the right to remain silent. You have to have evidence that's overwhelming. They've made it into a court case where lawyers get to decide whether you should be mentally committed to an institution or not in order to avoid committing people who shouldn't be committed. Many of you may have seen One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I grew up, I read that book, it was, it was a favorite of those who loved freedom. 
and it's all about the abuse that happens inside one of these hospitals by Nurse Ratchet, who takes advantage of her situation, bosses all these people around, infantilizes them, makes them into little kids so that she can retain her power structure. And at the end of the movie, one of the inmates ends up causing an uprising. He ends up getting lobotomized for it, but he inspires one of the guys who really shouldn't be there to break out of the prison and go free. That's the way in the 70s people viewed these institutions as horrible places where people who don't belong are being ripped apart by nurse, nurse ratchets everywhere. So now what do we have instead? <clears throat> we have homeless people living everywhere. I can't even go into work without kicking a homeless person off my front door at least once every two or three weeks and encouraging them to move along. And they have nowhere to go because they don't have hospitals where they can go anymore and receive care. And why is that? Because of a third court case called Wyatt v. Stickney in 1971. And this established that there is a constitutional right to treatment, that if you're committed to one of these, these institutions, you have a constitutional right to get medical care that will fix you, regardless of the cost. This was a court case that took $15 million and 30 years to go through the court system because they kept looking around to see what other precedents they could use to try and decide the issue, and they kept asking for what other evidence. And at the end, they established 35 minimum standards of care that any of these mental hospitals have to provide you at the state's expense for anyone who gets admitted. So if you pick up one of those homeless people and put them in to something that's supposed to take care of them, first of all, you can't do it anymore because of a previous court commit uh, decision that says they have to be dangerous, an imminent danger to somebody else. But even before that standard, now you have 35 different standards at a huge expense, and they have a constitutional right to get treatment that will fix them. Well, what if they can't be fixed? What if they've damaged their brain to the point where you can't fix it? So these are the court decisions that have emptied all of the hospitals and sent those people out onto the streets. Now, let's go to Nicholas Cruz. In addition to what's going on here, we had, under President Obama, a letter that he sent out, a Dear Colleague letter in January 2014, in which he said to all of the school systems, 16% of all of the blacks are, going, are being suspended each year. 11% of the Hispanics are being suspended each year, and only 5% of the non-Hispanic whites are being suspended each year. Therefore, this is evidence of racism, because it can't possibly be that blacks are committing three times as many disciplinary problems as whites. It must be because you horrible teachers just don't like the blacks. And so what he said is, we're going to sue you. We're going to sue you unless you start having an equal amount of suspensions for blacks, Hispanics, and whites. <coughs> Which effectively meant that all the whites are now getting in trouble for stuff that they normally wouldn't have gotten in trouble, and the blacks are not getting in trouble for things that are dangerous to the other people that are in the institution. Which is what happens when you treat people in a class rather than as an individual. You should look at people as an individual instead of as a group. So how does this affect what happened down in Florida? Well, there's actual evidence that the, the crime rate after this came down dropped by 78% in Cloward County. The crime rate of referrals of misbehaving kids to the local sheriffs declined by 78% because no one was being referred anymore. They could do all sorts of stuff in the classroom. They could punch the teachers in the face. They could empty their lunchbox on another kid. They could do whatever they wanted, and they would not be suspended because they thought that if you had a criminal record, you're less likely to get a job. You're less likely to be able to go into the military. If you have that felony, you're going to be stuck in a ghetto or stuck without a job, and it's the criminal record that causes you to have these problems, not the actual behavior. That's the way they thought. And so you have them bragging about how after this policy went into effect, this reform, the crime rate dropped 78%. Well, that's sort of what happens when you redefine crime. If 
you just redefine it so that it's no longer a crime. We saw the Obama administration do the same thing when it came to deportations. They wanted to show that there had been more deportations. So they changed the definition to deportation, not meaning take a illegal in America and send them down to Mexico. They said, as long as you move that illegal from one city in America to another city in America, that is now considered a deportation. So when you redefine what is is, as Bill Clinton did, you can pretty much justify anything. Or if you redefine what deportation is under Obama, you can make yourself look good without actually accomplishing anything. Or if you redefine what crime is, then all of a sudden, everyone is not a criminal. Except for Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Cruz is a criminal who never ended up being suspended. Despite the fact he had 37 referrals to the police, he had an FBI referral a couple weeks before he killed everybody, he threatened all of his teachers explicitly, so much so that they did not suspend him, but they transferred him to six different schools in the course of two years. Six schools, but they didn't want to call it expulsion because that would hurt his record. That would prevent him from getting a job. Or it might, if he was reported to the police as threatening people, that would give him a felony. But if he had a felony, he wouldn't have been able to buy a gun. He legally bought the AR-15 that he used to shoot up the entire place. But nobody wanted to refer him. Nobody wanted to hurt his record. No one wanted to prevent him from getting a job or from getting into a great college. So, why do we need new laws when we're not enforcing our existing laws? Why do we need new laws when the ACLU is going to force you to take people who are a threat to themselves and put them out on the street? We need to change some of the bad decisions and bad laws that we already have, and we need to enforce some of the laws that we already have, and actually send the people who commit crimes to jail if they need to be. You know, I had a speech not too long ago and it was the same concept that I've had to deal with with my son, Reagan. I said to him, Reagan, I once walked in and Jared had a fork and he was putting it into the electrical socket. And if I had let him continue, he would have been electrocuted and died on the spot. So I jumped on over there, grabbed the fork out of the hand, at his hand, he was about four years old, and paddled him on the butt until he cried. Now that caused some small amount of pain but it prevented him from killing himself the next day when I wasn't around because he remembered that sticking the fork in there was going to get him a spanking. So who was the good guy in this? I was because I saved his life. And do you think I liked hitting him? Yes, I think you did. No, I didn't. I don't enjoy causing pain, but I enjoy causing a small amount of pain if it's going to save somebody's life. That's what being a good father is. A good father means that we immunize our children against the hardships of life. Just like you go in and you get a shot, it's a small amount of poison that makes your body produce an antibody, so when you get that large amount of virus, you don't die from it. That's what fathers are supposed to be. We're supposed to instill some discipline, take away some pleasure, instill some, some pride, some rules. Some, some type of discipline to prevent you from your kids from coming like Nicholas Cruz. There was another statistic that came out recently about the number of mass murderers. I think it was 19 out of 20 of them didn't have a live-in father. 19 out of 20 of these mass murderers didn't have a father to catch them doing something wrong, to lovingly discipline, and make them grow up to be responsible individuals. Fellow Toastmasters.